I'd like to point out a very uh, obvious point that we are of course not talking about the club, intergovernmental club and diplomatic uh, uh, situation that we've had uh, uh, when the uh, EU was much smaller, but in an in a EU of 28, decision making is uh, made quite differently. The rule book for legislative activities uh, have, have uh, changed dramatically. And so have the role of the institutions, um, with the European Parliament now being uh, co-equal with the Council and the Commission also having changed its role quite considerably. So, um, without much further ado, um, I'd like to ask for some of the evidence uh, that uh, the two experts have on, um, first of all, the, the, the commission by Hussein, um, and then afterwards Simon. I'm going to talk about the, the UK influence in the commission, and um, I'm, I'm very, it's, it's important that Sarah mentioned non-political, um, a non-political perspective, because of course much is written, much is said about, much is spoken about the, um, about the Commission, but um, actually there has been very little empirical research done inside the organisation. And what um, I've been involved in a team, a leather team, um, that's done two major projects on the Commission, here's some information about where you can find more information about those projects, um, in 2008, to, um, 2009 and 2014, um, both were online survey centred but also um, interview based projects um, and um, you know, as I say you can read, read and find more about them but they were both, um, both of them attempted to test accepted wisdoms about the Commission so you know, we know that the Commission is meant to be composed of federalists populated by lawyers, an antiquated continental bureaucracy with all of that it implies bad things essentially. What we aim to do is just to test the extent to which this was true. So we were interested in um, soliciting the views, canvassing the opinions of, um, in the first instance, it was nearly 2,000 policy officials. In the second instance, in 2014, the survey did go out to all 33,000 members of staff and it was, it was completed by a uh, representative sample of, um, of 6,000. The overarching argument is, is a bit of an un interesting one in many ways. Um, the, um, we, we did demonstrate that many of the acceptable wisdoms are, are, are that, they're, they're mythical. Um, but so far as UK influence is concerned, the picture is very, very mixed. I'm going to start, um, influence is a, is, a sort of, is, is a contested term, it has multiple dimensions, we haven't really interrogated what it means here, but I want to start with one um, obvious definition or one obvious um, way of thinking about it, which is presence. And the way um, this has been done, um, the way we did this, was to imagine how many officials, how many members of staff there would be um, um, within the organisation if um, each set of nationals were present according to the relative share of the member state, the total EU population. Okay? So at zero, a member state would be perfectly represented. Would be perfectly represented. Now, this is a, a sort of, um, you know, we're trying to put this in, all in one table, but, um, which, is, which is a bit hard, but um, you can see that um, Belgium, um, staff are overwhelmed, Belgium's overwhelmingly represented in the organisation. But you'll see, as we get um, to the right-hand side of the picture, Italy, Spain, Poland, France, Germany, and especially the UK, are in deficit. And these deficits are very significant. So the figure you're given there is a def deficit in terms of the number of people. Okay, so that's, um, that's the brute figure from 2014. Now what we thought would be interesting to do is to focus on um, that particular quadrant. Okay, and so what we did was to look at the le different levels of seniority because we wanted to get a sense of whether this was a sort of continuing problem, whether it existed only amongst non-management administrators, or was a problem at middle management level or senior management level. Uh, what I'm showing you there is um, the blue block. Um, I hope that's labeled correctly. I'm very colorblind, so I, but I believe that's blue. Blue shows you two thousand, the figure for 2008, and that pinky red, I hope that's a pinky red, shows you the figure for 2014. Now you'll see that um, Poland had been very overrepresented, okay, the only, only country there shown above the line, and is less overrepresented now. 
But you'll see that for those other member states, many of the, you know, many of the large member states, um, their underrepresentation at this junior level of policy administrative, administrative staff um, has got worse. And it's got, no, no, it's got um, worse for Britain in particular. Um, middle managers, virtually all the countries um, that we're focusing on have, have done better, um, including the UK, but least so of all of those, let's call them problem cases. But senior managers is the, is, is the case, is the um, instance, the echelon where um, there really is still a problem. Um, so even over five years, there's an accelerating problem of um, lack of presence, and at the top level, um, it's got even worse. We're defining senior managers here as directors upwards, so including directors general. And you know, those of you who've watched the commission for, for many years know that even, even five or six years ago, if you went into a, to a directors general meeting and on a Thursday morning, there would be at least five directors general there. That's no longer British directors general, there. that's no longer the case. So that picture is bad, the, the, brut the brutal number is, is, is poor. But um, that's only one dimension of thinking about presence. Um, where they are based is also an issue. Um, since 2004, in particular for reasons that we might discuss in the, um, in the Q&A, there's been a process of presidentialization which has centralized power in the, in the presidential office and enabled the commission to take a more orderly, um, take a more orderly approach to, um, to creating legislative programs. And that's um, there's been a sort of corresponding response on the part of the other institutions, which means there's a much more sort of systematic approach to um, policy development at the um, at the Commission uh, within the EU as a, as, a, as a system. There's been a committed attempt to reducing the administrative burden. Um, there have been numerous exercises, um, it, um, starting under Prodi, under the uh, and in fact um, as a result of the sort of clinic reforms that have um, sought to um, simplify legislation, um, that have sought to um, ensure that legislation is not um, overly um, burdensome. The most, um, hes well, I hesitate to call it the most recent um, exercise, but Barroso's refit was a really important um, example um, of this. When you scrutinize all legislation, you think, okay, well, what can we do to, to simplify this, to, to make it easier to implement, to make it uh, less onerous? I know that the anecdotal sort of story is that um, the reason why we have so many, so much fewer um, rich represented in the commission, especially in senior position, is because it coincides with the retirement age yeah. of um, a whole yeah. generation of, of Brits came in um, in the seventies, uh, especially, and uh, got to uh, to to those positions. Um, but that the UK has failed uh, in delivering a new cohort of, yes. of, uh, of uh, analysts and, 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 uh, and yeah. senior people, is that yeah. correct? That, that's, that's absolutely correct and um, the question itself is anticipating there would be such a, a sort of democratic cliff, I mean it, it, um, it had a bunch of analyses of this and um, yes but I think it's an interesting question, it'd be one worth investigating. Yeah. Um, there are different routes into the Commission by um, if you, if you compare how different nationals get into the Commission by education and, and professional background, a lot of UK nationals found their way there via the civil service. So I wonder for how long that, um, that route has not, not proved very attractive. Sure. Yeah. And I remember doing a, um, a brainstorming in the, um, in the Foreign Office about this, and so the elephant, elephant in the room was, well, the whole atmosphere is so Eurosceptic. Would you want to chance your career by going to Brussels to pursue a career? Um, but then, I mean, a more, I mean, this is a sort of anecdotal ref reflection. But you know, in my um, in my um, sort of adult life, I can only remember a few years where um, you know the normal undergraduates, uh, let, let's say, the median undergraduate, think, "Ah, oh, I might go and work in Europe." It, it just hasn't featured on cognitive maps, sure. I'd say, yeah. of graduates. And we, that would be interesting to research. Simon will now take us through some of the the evidence for the UK's position in, in the Parliament and in the Council. We've obviously already heard several times today that there are references to um, the UK being outvoted in the Council. For example, uh, 72 votes in the Council were mentioned uh, a number of times by, by Lord Morrison. So, Simon, over to you. Uh, starting off with the Council, a lot of you have, have, have seen this figure. I've put up the numbers there to give it some context. So, this is based on vote watch data that Sarah Huddleman uh, collected as part of her research that is now part of Vote Watch that Sarah and I put together for a blog piece 
Um, looking at the votes in the council, 2004 to 9, 2009 to 2015, that says losing side. Uh, uh, so you can see that 24 to 2009, the UK voted 12 times against the majority and abstained 12 times. You add that together and you get just over 2%. There just wasn't that much contestation in the council. Council contestation has gone up significantly. If you look at the 2009 to 2015 period, UK more than 12% of the time has either voted against or abstained when a majority has or a unanimous abstention um, has passed against the wishes of the UK. But that might sound a lot, and if you add it up, it looks like 42 plus 12 plus all the rest of them before comes to 72. Um, whereas in fact, in proportional terms, it's still pretty small. The UK, if you turn it the other way around, 616 times out of a total of however many that was, um, uh, has been voting on the yes side in favour of things. So you could say that what has happened is that the propensity of the UK to willingly be on record as voting against the majority has gone up. Now, often votes are taken in the shadow of a vote, and people know that they lose. And France, according to the records, suggests it never ever loses in the council. You know, all the time France loses in the council. You know, all the time France loses on the passage of directives. Even French officials will admit that. But they never ever go on record as voting against the council majority. They'll just say, we, we know there was going to be a majority, we don't want it to go on record that we voted against it. So what has happened is the British government has allowed itself, for whatever reason, to go on record saying it's voted against the majority, more than any other member state. Fifteen governments mentioned the UK as the first, if just the number one, he actually gives you a rank order, fifteen other member states named the UK first when asked which other member state do you talk to in the EU. And if you, if you just run a kind of simple yeah. network map for the three periods of his data, 2006, 2009, 2012, the UK comes out in the middle. So, I mean, you know, clearly our policymakers, for whatever reason, are at the heart of decision making in the council. Every other member state wants to know what the Brits are going to do about this, what's the British position on this, and, and or a, lot, a large number of other member states, more than half of the other member states, think that the Brits are the key players to go to. So I think it's an interesting message when thinking about bargaining inside the council. This suggests that we really still are at the centre. Um, a very different picture when you come to the European Parliament. And in fact, you know, we kind of, interestingly, the debate this morning, we obsess about the Commission. Well, anyone who knows anything about the way the EU institutions have gone, we've seen a decline in the power of the Commission in the legislative process. Commission officials will admit that and a significant increase in the power of the European Parliament. And what is amazing is how isolated British MEPs are in the European Parliament. And you get that anecdotally talking to them, but you also get it from the data. So, so this shows the pr proportion of time that the plurality of a member state's MEPs were on the losing side, or sorry, on the winning side of votes in the European Parliament. It's the three main groups in the middle of the Parliament that, that are on the winning side more than any of the other groups. It varies a little bit across time, but not much. It's basically these three groups are on the winning side governing what goes on inside the European Parliament against the other member states. I'm working on a new blog on a policy area, and it shifts by policy area. Hopefully, that will come out soon. But the interesting thing is when you actually look at the, what's happened is, of course, <coughs> the Conservatives have left the EPP and now sit in the group to the right of the EPP. Finally, then, talk, thinking about the politics in the bigger picture, one thing I think that Britain is really missed out on is this new process of choosing the Commission President. And we have this narrative, it was, it was fascinating watching the, the 2014 European Parliament elections and how the British government reacted, and how the British media reacted to this new process of choosing the Commission President. The interpretation from the British government and, and from number 10 was, um, the treaty says the Commission President is still chosen by the heads of government in the European Council. Every other member state said, no, we actually changed the treaty. And what we said was that the heads of government have to take into account the outcome of a European election and the Commission President is now elected by the European Parliament. That's what it says in the treaties. Our government, for whatever reason, tried to pretend the treaties had not been changed. The treaties had been changed, their signature was on the treaties, it had been ratified by the House of Commons, they tried to pretend the treaties had not been changed. They tried to pretend that actually there's no new way of choosing the Commission President and there was a whole kind of crazy Stop Juncker campaign. And, and Pressure, I've heard, from number 10 to the BBC not to cover the Spitz and Candidate process. I did some training in the BBC, and the BBC journalist told me they decided they shouldn't cover the process because it would upset number 10. Um, this is then a number of articles in the British press citing the two main candidates, Juncker and Schultz, um, compared to the German press coverage. 
The German press, this is a German-Austrian debate, here's the debate of the, the, the week of the Eurovision where they all debated together, here's the week of the European Parliament elections. This is the British press. No coverage whatsoever of this process. Cameron runs this Stop Juncker campaign afterwards and fails Disney. UK policymakers play a central role in EU decision making, which has, has actually led to policy outcomes being close to, to UK government preferences. But I'd like to know if that's still the case now because this data is a bit outdated. The UK has not, is not afraid to be outvoted in the council, is how I would interpret the actual raw voting data. I don't know what necessarily that means substantively. The UK, British MEPs have become isolated in the European Parliament. That's largely due to the fact that we just have not many MEPs in the main groups in the European Parliament. That's partly the fact that the British Conservatives have left the EP, and partly the fact that there just aren't many Lib Dems and Social Dem and Labour left in the other two groups in the European Parliament. They're all in UKIP and, and the Tories uh, in the more radical right parties in the European Parliament. UK parties and politicians have opted out of the emerging new democratic parties. Now let me read one final thing, which was an email I got after I posted. I'm not going to read the whole thing. So, an email that I forwarded to her saying, which was after one of my first posts, I got an email from an anonymous, I will say, European Commission official. And he said the following. Um, 20 years ago, I came to Brussels and we, naming him and his country folk, were all in awe of UK political administrative capacity and especially the Machiavellian UCREP. The Brits were as good as as or even better than the French. We used to joke that as the only, only the French and the Brits used to run empires, their administrations just changed gear from running the world to now running the EU. Uh, the, this mechanism, the mechanism, blah, 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 blah. And then he gives evidence, loads and loads of evidence. And then he says, but some time ago all this changed. The UK started to send younger and younger national civil servants to the council. The other northern liberals who used to rely on the UK as their natural leader got lost. And, t and a 21-year-old person with no other language than English directly from university cannot, regardless of other capacities, lead to complex political and technical negotiations in council working groups. The UK has, for some strange reason, voluntarily isolated itself from the mainstream of decision making in Brussels. And that's from an official from one of our close allies in the Commission. Thank you. I wondered uh, if you could both perhaps elaborate a bit about whether this tension is what has also come up in the previous panels between the intergovernmental sort of all diplomatic way of doing business and then the fact that we now have the, the increase of supranational uh, institutions and, and powers in those institutions and, and their way of now doing um, business in, in a, a political system that is, is quite different to other intergovernmental settings. Is that how we should, we should think about it? Um, I, there's certainly some truth to that. I think, for some reason, um, we like to pretend that the single market, which ultimately is what we care about, is still largely governed by intergovernmental bargaining. It's clearly not. A lot of the big business is done by intergovernmental bargaining, but we're not really that much in, you know, clearly foreign policy we're involved, but we're not in EMU, and that's intergovernmental. We're not, re we're not in Schengen, and that's largely intergovernmental. We're not in, um, you know, we are involved in budgetary bargains, and that's intergovernmental. But the day-to-day -day bread and butter business of the EU is done through supranational decision making, where the European Parliament is a co-equal player with the Council, where the Commission is much weaker than it used to be. And, and there's lots of checks and balances, so it's impossible to get crazy stuff out of that, that decision making process. But I get a sense that there's no effort to, to understand or even explain to the British people how that works, or even to think strategically about what that means politically. And I think that, yes, you can argue for whatever political reasons it might have been right for the British Conservatives to leave the EPP. But if, if, you know, if Fidesz can stay in the EPP, then surely the British Conservatives can politically. I mean, so you then think about, it, Cameron thought it was very cheap and easy. Who cares about which group people sit in? The European politics is largely irrelevant. Well, in fact, it is, you could argue it's largely irrelevant for domestic British politics. But it's hugely important for understanding how politics works in, in Brussels. And that's the, the EPP run the show right now, and the UK is not part of that cabal. I don't worry about Eurozone caucusing, I worry about EPP caucusing. Well, it's, it's very interesting. I'm Danish, and from a Danish perspective, the points that are being made here about the checks and balances and how the UK views this setup um, and uh, is, is actually seen from the flip side in most of the continental Europe that the checks and balances 
have to happen through the European Parliament as well as the Commission. And uh, that's the way the parliamentary oversight of the executive also needs to be in place. But, but here it has to be in the intergovernmental uh, uh, bargaining space with the, with the national parliament. So that, that, that tension, I think, is very real. Um, I'd like to open up to questions afterwards, but Hussein, please also yeah. give your view on I mean, this. I, 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 agree with, um, I agree with Simon on the way I identify this is a disengagement by both political parties, both um, from the sort of European process or, or ambivalence at best um, about that. I think the point about the EPP is a particularly important one um, because one of the key decisions about the introduction of the Spitz and Kandil Artem process um, was taken at the Estoril Conference of the EPP, 10 Prime Ministers present, including at that time um, Barroso, but no, no British Conservative. Um, and so, you know, these, I, mean, I think they were motivated by um, reasons of symbolism rather than anything else, but they have cost um, sort of politically um, in, um, in Brussels at the EU level. Mm -hmm. The coalition essentially said that they put down a marker um, and uh, what has happened is a lot of legislation is passed at first reading now so it's not a long negotiating process there aren't you're not going to come back to the table multiple times uh, but you think that they might come back with the legislation in two or three years time so let's put down a marker and I'm counting of course abstention here as well because often what's going on in abstention is you're putting down a marker to say I'm not in favor of this guy and I want it on the record and I think it's more that the fact that the British government is happy to have this on record and they can come home and the press, if the press is critical about something coming out of Brussels, they can say, we abstain, we didn't vote in favour of this. And so they feel it's a sense of a, a protection against potential criticism. If I can just add one little point to this, because I do a lot of my research on the council and all this voting behaviour. One thing we've seen develop, apart from actual voting by now taking place and having voting records in the council, which is a very new phenomenon in the council, now the uh, governments actually also submit what's called formal statements or policy statements and so we see much more of this formalization in the council meetings even where a number of countries are seen as much more willing or needing to, uh, to send these signals um, back home especially uh, and uh, of why they either abstain or oppose or just have concerns about certain policy uh, proposals so it's a trend but I think the UK has been leading on this. Um, uh, certainly pushed for the formalization and the transparency also into um, uh, this voting behavior to actually take place in the council by now. It's no longer this club dynamic so that we, we saw previously. So Hussain, please, and then I'll take a few more questions. Yes. Um, the I did, I, well, obviously, translation and interpretation are important services. I mean, my, my point was, was not that they ought to be, it's not about their relative size, it was just about um, the number of Brits that are found there. Why, why you know, there should be as, as many Brits there as there are in uh, competition, in, you know, in, in environment um, competition, and the others as there are in, in, in those um, you know, sort of functional service DGs, uh, let's call them. Um, when we've looked at motivation for joining the um, the Commission. We looked at the linkages between, um, it's not straightforward to do at all, we're looking for proxies and they're pretty imperfect, but we, we, we looked to see whether um, the kind of wage, the kind of salary you might earn domestically is a, is a sort of push-pull factor. Um, we didn't really find very high, high correlation um, there actually. Um, but why do people join the Commission? They join it um, to, because they have a commitment to Europe and that emerges as the number two motivation. The number one motivation is to work in an international environment. Um, competitive remuneration comes third, but actually um, doing important policy work um, is also a rising motivation. Um, so even if remuneration plays a part, it's not the only. Um, it's, it's not the only, it's not driving force. Yeah. The final result was 27 to 2 in the vote in the European Council, and it was Orbán and Cameron against everybody else. And uh, uh, you know. Of course, lots of other governments privately, lots of other heads of government privately said to Cameron that we agree, we don't like Juncker, we don't like this Spitz and candidate thing. And of course, the big member states have the most to lose from this thing taking off. But it has happened, and I knew there was, there was political commitment from CDU as a party, from the SPD as a party, from Social Democrats across Europe, and from the EPP across Europe. And to underestimate that political commitment, I think, I think was a mistake. Um, and I, I, the other thing to point out is, I don't know if you followed it, but the Parliament has just passed a report on how it's going to run in five years' time. And, and, and I wouldn't, my bet would be, this is how it's going to run in five years' time. 
<laughs> which means that there will have to be candidates 12 weeks before and so on and so on. There's going to be a time period, there's going to be spending uh, regulations and, and the rest of it. And, and my bet is in five years' time, this will be a much bigger thing than it was this time round. And for us to pretend that's not going to happen is very dangerous.